May I please introduce you to Judith Hawley, our chair for this evening. Hello, thank you, Rachel, and welcome to you all. Um, thank you, Rachel, for introducing and also hosting this series of, of lectures and also to the many other people who've worked behind the scenes to make this possible. And not least, we're very grateful to our sponsors, the National Lottery Heritage Fund and many other organizations and individuals, some of whom who might be with us. We're really grateful to you for the audience for, for being here, for demonstrating your interest in Twickenham and the many luminaries of the past, and also for demonstrating that Twickenham is still full of wonderfully cultured people. Uh, as Rachel said, there'll be people gradually entering from the virtual waiting room, so I'll repeat some of the practical information again um, in a moment. Sorry to, to bore those who've been patiently uh, waiting since six. Now, uh, Rachel referred to uh, a group of us working together. There are a number of heritage organisations who were planning to run a series of events on gardens and grottoes during the Twickenham Festival, which should have taken place in June, but we all know why that didn't happen. But we really wanted to um, make sure that people could still access what we have to offer. And also it gave us a really exciting opportunity to work together for the first time. And one of the things that we've been noticing through this course of lectures is just how many connections there are, in fact, between the different houses and different people who lived in and around Twickenham. And if you either have attended more than one lecture or if you're interested enough to look at these lectures recorded on our YouTube channel, you'll be able to spot lots of those connections. And I'm, I'm kind of hoping that the word China will come up again. <laughs> in today's lecture. Some of you will, will know why. So that's introducing you to the series and the lectures, but let me introduce our speaker, Ricky Pound, who some of you will know already as the, um, the house director of Turner's House Museum. In this talk, Ricky will be using his architectural knowledge to share with you the features at Sandicombe Lodge that may have been influenced by Turner's great friend, Sir John Soane. Ricky is familiar with the architecture of this part of the Thames, having previously worked at Chiswick House, Marble Hill House, and Orleans House Gallery. He is, you know, the, the curator of the Twickenham Luminaries. There are very few places where it seems he hasn't, um, hasn't worked. Ricky has a particular interest in the symbolism of architecture, and Sir John Soane remained Ricky's favourite architect. Thank you very much, and over to you, Ricky. I'll switch off my camera now. Thank you very much for that very eloquent introduction. I'm <laughs> uh, flattered by it. So yes, I'm here today. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here as well, to be part of this collective and able to advertise this fantastic heritage that we've got on this, in this part of London, particularly down uh, by the river and in the, uh, this kind of Arcadian Thames environment. So I want to first of all talk a little bit about the 12 principal architectural features that I've picked out here that I hope by the end of this talk will demonstrate the, the, you know, the influence of Sir John Soane on Turner's house, which is quite profound. Now Turner was a frequent guest to Sir John's house at number 13 Lincoln's Inn Fields at Holborn and his abode at Pitsanger Manor in Ealing, which Soane owned from 1800 to 1810. Indeed, Turner was one of the only guests allowed to spend the night after receptions hosted there by the Soans. Soane and Turner also shared a passion for fishing and often went together on the rivers uh, Thames and Brent or beside the ponds of Pitsanger Manor. It is known that King was, uh, sorry, Soane was a keen uh, eel fisherman, whilst Turner liked to fly and float fish. So here we have the familiar front elevation of Turner's house. Another love that bound Turner and Soane together was that of architecture. Indeed, Turner declared that if he could have had his life again, he would have been an architect. His building at Twickenham was his attempt to fulfill this dream and design a rural retreat for himself and his father, whom he affectionately called Old Dad. Turner had a lifelong interest in architecture, and it was a subject that would feature in many of his paintings, including structures such as churches, bridges, 
castles, stone circles, ancient temples, coastal fortifications, lighthouses, windmills, industrial architecture and other such buildings. The subject of light was another consideration that bound Turner and Stone together as both professors experimented with the effects of light and the emotions it created in the viewer within architecture and painting. And here's a lovely uh, illustration here, an engraving of Isleworth from Turner's Liebes Studiorum. Uh, so just literally just up the road with the temple there that actually remains today. So here are some of the architectural features I will be talking briefly about, which I said earlier, what I hope to demonstrate will show Soames' uh, influence here at Turner's house. We're going to start off with the triglyphs. So the building of, tri of Sandy Coombe Lodge took place over two distinct periods. Turner brought the land on which the, uh, the house would eventually be built in 1807, but it was not until 1810 that Turner erected the central freestanding tower. The tower was made of brick and was not covered by render, as was thought pre-conservation. Towards the top of the tower, a band of decoration known as triglyphs runs beneath the sloping roof, creating a symbolic uh, pediment. Now, such pediments were characteristic features of ancient Greek and Roman architecture. In the Renaissance, the pediment was revived and incorporated into domestic buildings, such as those of the architect Andrea Palladio and his assistant, Vincenzo Scamosi, and often featured in, as I say, churches and many of his villas. And this particular one is the most famous of all. It's the Villa Capra or La Rotonda in Italy. Now, three buildings that Turner was familiar with, two of which had very prominent and distinctive pediments with triglyph bands running beneath, were the Greek Doric temples at Piestrum in Italy. Turner visited the site on his Italian trip of 1819 and illustrated them in his Naples, Piestrum and Rome sketchbook, together with a mezzotint from his Little Libus series. Turner was, had earlier used the existing source to illustrate lecture number 52 of the Temple of Neptune at Piestrum, almost certainly after an engraving by Peronese. Now Giovanni Battista Peronese was an influential artist and engraver who had extensively illustrated the temple complex after his visit to them in 1777. 15 of 17 of the corpus of drawings were purchased by John Soane at auction in 1817. Soane had visited and surveyed the Greek temples whilst on his grand tour of 1778 and subsequently had cork models built to accompany his Royal Academy lectures and to enable his students to take an alternative grand tour. Now, Soane also employed the triglyph band on some of his more rustic projects, including this illustration of a dairy building at Hamels Park. You'll notice that the side of the buildings are curved very distinctively in a similar manner to that of the extensions of Sandy Coombe Lodge, which were added as to the independent tower around 1813. Now, in addition, Soane also used triglyph configurations at his townhouse at Lincoln's Inn Fields and on his long, longest running project, which was about 45 years, that of the Bank of England. That JMW Turner was familiar with the architecture of the Bank of England is not in question, as it was here that he deposited his money. Now, returning to the main tower, I wanted to concentrate on the, the, the Diocletian window or the semicircular window at the base of the house. Now, the Diocletian window was a feature of Roman architecture. Actually, the term Diocletian comes from the Roman Emperor Diocletian and was employed by Renaissance architects and popularised by Andrea Palladio and his assistant Vincenzo Scamozzi and later used by British uh, Neo-Palladians, including William uh, Kent, Henry Flickcroft, Lord Burlington, and the later work of James Gibbs. Locally Diocletian windows were found at Lord Burlington's house at Chiswick, where four were located in the drum of the Central Hall, as you can see here. 
Now, in 1788, William Cavendish, the fifth Duke of Devonshire, added two wing buildings at Chiswick, both of which uh, provided Diocletian windows at ground floor level to light the basement rooms. And you can just see the one on the right hand side there. Well, thermal windows were also drawn uh, by, by uh, Turner and he also saw them on the ends of the bridge at Richmond, as you can see here, which was built in 1774 to 1777 by architects James Payne and Kenton Coase. Now, Payne was a Neo-Palladian architect. His work highly influenced by the, work, by the architecture of Richard Boyle and William Kent. In addition, Turner included a thermal window in his lecture diagram number 26 of the interior of the Great Room at Somerset House in London. Now, Johnstone also employed the Diocletian window, most famously, I think, uh, in stable blocks, but extensively at the Bank of England, where they appear in the rotonda above research, uh, recessed arches, and you can see them here. Now, in addition, Soane used a series of thermal windows to light the basement of the waiting court's uh, loggia at the Bank of England. And this is where Turner may have got the idea for the semicircular window at Sandy Coombe Lodge to illuminate the below stairs kitchen. Now, on the exterior of Sandy Coombe Lodge, Turner incorporated recessed panels, as you can see here, into the brickwork to give more variety and depth of architecture, to create shadows and to provide contrasts within the brickwork. The use of recessed panelling as a decorative rather than a functional feature can be seen in a number of other buildings by Soane, most notably that at Pittshanger Han uh, Manor and the Dulwich Gallery, with its stripped back neoclassicism bringing a melancholic feel to its architecture. And here we have, of course, Turner's House before the restoration. So the recent conservation of Turner's House included the removal of the rendering from the exterior of the tower section, so the central section, as we can see. The expo this exposed the original brickwork, leading to the revelation that the wet cement had undergone a process known as penny line pointing. Now, you may wonder what penny line pointing is. So penny line pointing was a technique where a lined indentation was made with an old penny to regularize the look of the pointing and give the bricks the illustration of sharp edges. The presence of penny line pointing meant that the house was never intended by Turner uh, to be rendered as there would be little point in applying the render, which was a very time consuming process, only to cover it up. The conclusion therefore is that the rendering was applied at a later date. And the little red arrows will show you where that penny line pointing technique is and you, as you can see, to give you that finished effect. Now, John Soane also used penny line pointing with exposed brickwork on many of his architectural creations, including the Dulwich Picture Gallery, his house at Holborn and Pittshanger Manor. The use of rough bricks aesthetically created a rustic feel to the property, properties, which fitted into the architectural ideas prevalent at the period and in those particular theories concerning the primitive hut and primitivism. Indeed, in, in Soane's first lecture at the Royal Academy, as an architect uh, doing the origins of architecture, the accompanying illustrations were held up for, by, to the audience by none other than J.M.W. Turner himself. Now, by 1813, Turner had decided to extend the Tower House at Twickenham into a family home. Uh, and archaeological evidence has shown that the tower was unlikely to have contained staircases or floors before this time. In order to achieve this, Turner produced a number of sketches showing different designs for a pair of new side buildings which could attach to the tower. Given the strong Sonian influences in these two side buildings, Sone's involvement is most likely. It is possible that Soane suggested to Turner that the three original windows and off-centre door, which I've illustrated here, be bricked up and a new centralised portico added to the structure. The original openings have been dressed on the top by flat or straight arches in imitation of vasseurs, similar to those used by Soane at Lincoln's Inn Fields and by George Dance the Younger at Pitt's Hanger. The two Sandy Coombe wing buildings were largely symmetrical, providing balance to the structure. 
Now, as an architectural historian, Bruce Boucher has recently pointed out the profile of the front of Sandy Coombe Lodge with its pair of half pedimented roofs combined with the broken triglyph band is strikingly reminiscent of a design by William Kent and in particular the Doric Garden Temple of the Earl of Leicester's estate at Holcombe, which can be dated to 1731. And so you can see the profile there is very similar. Now, the source of Kent's design is undoubtedly a pared down version of Andrew Palladio's churches, such as this one here at San Giorgio Magora. This was been a suitable choice for a striking temple like solution employed by Turner, designed to make the villa all the more imposing from the exterior. Some, like Kent and Lord Burlington before him, were influenced by the great Renaissance master architect Andrea Palladio, who is recognised today as probably the most influential architect in the history of the Western world. So the stripped down primitive style of the building was complemented by a minimal use of two bands of egg and dark castings positioned above the doorway, derived from Turner sketches of Sir, the Christ, Sir Christopher Wren monument in the city of London, as we can see on the right. Turner uh, recorded the details in his windmill and lock sketchbook. So now we're about to go inside. So during the restoration project, Butler Hegarty architect revealed the presence of faux marble, as in, uh, uh, indicated here on the left, on the walls in the hall. This was lovingly created to produce a marbling effect that Turner would have been familiar with. The hall also fears distinctive roll mouldings, the type frequently employed by Soane at his properties. So the painted marble effect on the walls was popular in the late Georgian period. John Soane had similar faux marble applied to the walls at nearby Pitsanger Manor which has recently been revealed during restoration and a really good restoration, I must say, and reinstated in the vestibule in different colours, including the one that resembles porphyry with its own Egyptian and ultimately Roman imperial connotations. And it's a home in Holborn, so also used paint to resemble yellow uh, sienna marble. Beautiful. So one of the most prominent and visually striking features inside Turner's house is this succession of arches leading from the hall to the sitting room, small parlour and dining room. Such arches were an important element in Soane's architectural vocabulary and were present most, you know, most readily in Soane's house at 13 Lincoln's Inn Fields, the Dulwich Picture Gallery, the Bank of England and Pitsanger Manor amongst others. And I think we get a really good comparison here. Uh, we've got Turner's house on the left and we've got Soane's house in Holborn on the right. And you can see the use of double arches and the staircase in the background going up uh, to the upper level. And here we have another good example. We have the use of arches in succession at the Bank of England and of course at Pitsanger Manor as you go upstairs on the landing with the lovely statue on the niche on the left hand side. Now Soane's employment of arches often running in succession were arguably derived from Giovanni Battista Peronese's pronounced employment of arches in his drawings, themselves highly influenced by the monumental triumphal arches of ancient Rome, together with bridge arches and arches supporting domes. That Turner was familiar with the work of Peronese is without doubt, as Turner's friend Soane was a great collector of his art and housed 15 of the original Paestrum drawings in his house at Lincoln's Inn Fields. So uh, had previously met Peronese in 1778 when he was on his grand tour shortly before the Italian's death, where he was presented with four engravings including the Arch of Constantine and the Arch of Septimus Severus. And here are some from the imaginary prison series, which allegedly uh, were created as a result of illness within Peronese after a mosquito bite. Now, Turner also copied several of Peronese's imaginary prison scenes with an emphasis on exploring the effects of light and shadow. 
In addition, Perenese's dark taste for the sublime would appeal to, to, to appeal to Turner's aesthetic sensibilities, in particular Turner's representations of the epic scale and terrifying aspects of nature, compared with the transitory and often fragile and precarious nature, existence of mankind, so something we would call the sublime that we can see here, I think, in the very small scale of the humans in this massive natural landscape. As Gary Butler from uh, Botley Hegarty uh, elaborates, it is the imminent threat lurking in the natural world that is the source of Turner's vision at Sandycombe, perhaps even the raison d'etre for returning to the country or leaving the city to go fishing. Sandy Coombe Lodge is a rustic building rather than an essay about the ideal temple and can perhaps be described as a hermitage. Now in the dining room that leads from the hall we have this absolutely lovely and impressive marble fireplace. It is unknown whether the fireplace was a later uh, uh, introduction or whether it was at Sandy Coombe during Turner's residency here. Uh, the form of the fireplace is very Sonian in character, and although no designs in Sone's hands for such a fireplace have yet been found, it does remain a very distinct possibility that it is contemporary with Turner and in situ since, you know, in his time. In addition, the colour of the marble is a good match for the use of the dark marbling on the skirting boards in the hall. The original mushroom pink colour of the walls in this room were revealed through forensic examination by Helen Hughes and returned to its original colour during the restoration. Although a popular 19th century colour, it is known that Soane also employed the same palette in some of his rooms. So now I want to move on to the very impressive staircase here, something quite unusual to find in a house of this size. So another, another notable feature at Turner's house is the staircase and its iron balustrade, which extends anti-clockwise to the two bedrooms on the first floor. Halfway up on, on the right is a niche, which in Turner's time could have contained a plaster caster figure of, of the sun god Apollo, or a Wedgwood urn, or it may have been left unoccupied. The relationship between the staircase, the location of the niche on the, and, uh, and its balustrade, reached by walking under a succession of arches from the hall, uh, had a very strong relationship uh, with similar staircases at Soane's house, at particular, of course, number 13 Lincoln's Inn Fields. Such similarities were reinforced with the faux marble decoration on the staircase walls and the lay light positioned immediately above, which we can see here. So spanning the top of the stairs is a shallow, wooden elliptical arch which is also a Sonian feature. The arch is very similar for instance to one that appears in JMW Tur Turner's painting Forum Romanum of 1826 which is framed by a shallow arch and shows the arch of Titus. Turner painted this view of the Forum specifically for Sone as a reminder of his extensive grand tour and love of classical architecture. So used similar shallow arches at Wimpole Hall and Freemasons Hall in London. And here we can see him using it again. In this case, it's, uh, it frames a, a statue of the, Abolo, of the Apollo Belvedere, which used to be owned by Lord Burlington before being moved over here slightly later to Soane's Museum. So in this slide, the, the plaster cast model of the Belvedere uh, but at the Sir John Soane Museum is displayed against two shallow arches and is framed at the top of the stairs, such as at Turner's house. So there, he is. so there he is. Now the ley light also illuminates the staircase with its floral motif and has been identified by the glass historian Michael Piover as being contemporary with the building of Sandy Coombe Lodge. It is similar to glass used at Sir John Soane's home at Lincoln's Inn Field and would also indicate that Turner used Soane's glass supplier. Now the floral motif in the lay life at Sandy Coombe Lodge is a moving work of art, it's something quite extraordinary in fact, which at certain times of the year is projected onto the base of the walls beneath, depending on the position of the sun. In its earliest period the house was actually known as Solace Lodge following the idea of solitude and seclusion, but with also the notion of a temple of the sun, sort of playing on the, world, the, the, the words invisible or invincible sun. 
Now, Soane is often referred to as the master of space and light and used tinted glass of different colours to, to create combinations with reflective surfaces to reflect and reflect light, to create a range of emotions in the viewer, uh, dependent on the time of day and the time of year. This had great similarities to the paintings of Turner, of course, and in particularly those of the later years, where his, ex his extensive use of yellow, lack of detail, and the abstract nature of his works were meant to inspire emotions within the viewer that went beyond form and substance. And we've got this lovely illustration here uh, from the crypt at the Dulwich Picture Gallery, just uh, highlighting that. Now, as Gary Butler explains once more, in full control of the exterior, the architect can manipulate light, form, material and sequential movement to invoke the poetic imagination. And it is here that architecture is most similar to painting. Soane's built work is often described as an architectural analogy to turn as poetic blend of light and matter. And we can see an, an example here, uh, 1845, so towards the end of Turner's life, of that use of yellow, the indistinct forms trying to create within the viewer these emotions. Although no, des no designs exist for Turner's house in Soane's hands, its influence at the house is undeniable and particularly strong. Although JMW Turner designed the house, he almost certainly turned to his friend for assistance and advice. That no design in Turner's hand has yet, sorry, in Soane's hand has yet been, has just yet surfaced is not surprising, as both men saw each other regularly, and and such designs could have been disguised, uh, dis, uh, discussed privately at a number of locations, including at Soane's properties, at the Royal Academy, or on fishing trips. So Sandy Coombe Lodge is Turner's largest work of art and serves as a monument to Turner's desire to test himself as an architect and as Sir John Soane's standing as London's leading architect, but ultimately as a testament to the friendship of two of the most brilliant minds of their day. Thank you. And thank you, Ricky. I mean, that was fantastic. I enjoyed that uh, greatly. Um, I learned so much about uh, Turner and so on. I only really thought of Turner as, as a painter and as somebody who worked on flat surfaces and with um, very broad brush strokes, but to find this interest in, in detail, including um, you know, the use of a penny <laughs> to make the kind of mark is, is just just fascinating. Um, we've got a, a few questions already, um, but I'm going to before I, I take those, I'm going to remind people of how they can ask questions because some people will have missed the introduction. So sorry to those of you who've heard this about three times already. Um, if you would like to ask a question because you're you're muted. Um, you can move your cursor on your screen and a, a row of, of tools and buttons uh, will, will appear and there's a little bubble marked chat. Click on that and you'll have the option of, of, of addressing questions either to Rachel Morrison, but it's quicker if you address them to me and my name is Judith Hawley. And I can see some questions are coming in now, Ricky, so I'm going to read out. So, so. Okay. Um, the, the first question we, we had was, I thought, really fascinating because your talk reveals such a lot about um, the skills of individuals, but also about the nature of, uh, of training and professionalism during the period. So our first question was about whether or not there was any formal training for architects during this period. Could Turner actually just have become an architect without undergoing any kind of professional training first? It's, it's a very good question. Ob obviously, uh, Turner's known for his paintings and he's, he was very early into the Royal Academy. He was a very early student. Uh, and part of that training would have been, uh, uh, part of it would have been architecture. We know, for instance, there were a couple of people that he studied under. Uh, I think it goes back to the, the quote that Turner said, if he could live his life again, he would have been an architect. Now, I think mm -hmm. the reason he didn't become an architect is because he thought he could make more money in painting. Right. But with Turner, what is very interesting, he never really goes too far away from architecture. In all of his paintings, even if you could, you, you, this, this, you know, the scenes of the sea where you've got the boats, they're all man-made boats. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it, it's mm -hmm. us 
interacting with architecture. And I think, you know, this is something that stayed with him and was incredibly intrinsic, in fact, and something that really formed an association with, with Soane once they finally got to meet. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Soane was uh, a son of a, uh, of a bricklayer, so it was part, it was in the bones, as it, as it were. Uh, Turner, from a very early age, apart from having that in, in, interest in architecture, was drawing architecture. You know, his, his father was displaying his paintings very early on uh, in, in, in his barbers. You know, he was displaying them in the window. So I think for Turner, it was always part and parcel uh, of what he was doing and never, ever really went too far away. Uh, you know, in, ter mm. in terms of training, as I say, Turner did have some, obviously, uh, Sohn had a lot more. Uh, he was studying on dance, uh, of course, mm -hmm. and and what really set Soane on fire was that time away on the Grand Tour. Mm -hmm. I think everything can be brought back to what he learnt on that Grand Tour, even though it was cut short because he he wanted he thought he had commissions in Ireland and come back. Uh, I think these two would have sparked, absolutely sparked, when it comes to architecture. And you know what, Turner was was no idiot when it comes to architecture. He studied the books. You know, mm -hmm. Soane uh, loaned him books, and Turner read them. And mm. Turner had this intrinsic interest in architecture, as he did with many other things, uh, origins of architecture. And of course, when Soam was working on those early lectures for the Royal Academy, Turner was there as well. They were probably working in the same room often, swapping mm. back. Mm. Mm. And, uh, you know, and, and Soam would go to Turner's lectures and Turner would go to Soam's lectures. Although I think Soam's lectures would have been a, a, a much easier to follow because Turner was known to, you, you know, to, to not be very eloquent, to mumble a lot, and how much you've actually got out of those lectures of Turner's is something different. But certainly the the idea of perspective as well would some would have been something that Soane would have would really have relished and, and liked to know more about. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I've got one very very detailed question, and then there's some some really interesting large questions as well. So think think about the bricklaying again. Um, is penny line pointing the same as tuck pointing? Oh, that's a very good question and one I think I'd have to look at. I'm not entirely sure, to be quite honest. Yeah. Uh, what, what I will say about the penny line pointing, we have to remember, before the restoration of Turner's house, before the rendering was taken off, that they knew nothing about penny line pointing being there. Mm. When they removed the rendering and they saw the penny line pointing, this was a revelation because they always thought it had been rendered from Turner's time. And that created a completely different aesthetic for the building. A mm, set, different mm, set mm. of emotions almost, because yeah. it's not what they thought it was. And it wasn't in the original uh, vision. But as I said earlier, if you go to, if you go to uh, the trouble of doing a whole house, doing penny line pointing, you will, know, you will not render it. <laughs> uh, and another thing that they discovered, as I think I, I, I pointed out, when they took the rendering off the front of the house, they found these very strange openings that had been bricked up that had to be from Turner's time. But something was very odd about them because only two or three of them matched up. You had an off-sense doorway, uh, which was actually aligned to the window at the, on the left-hand side, but the two on the right-hand side weren't aligned at all. So it was a higgledy-piggledy mess. Mm. And I'm sure Soane would have said to Turner, look, we need to we, we we need to make this more symmetrical. We need to brick them up, because of course, without them being bricked up, you couldn't have had that lovely staircase that came slightly later. So mm. they were bricked up, more centralised portico, uh, just you know, and a place where, of course, uh, I hope I got it through. That old dad could come and stay. Yeah. Old dad is the heart, really, of Turner's house and was for thirteen years. Mm. I've got some questions uh, which follow on from that about how Turner lived in the house and how he yeah. entertained there. So one question is, uh, are there any records from the time of people visiting Turner's house? Uh, we have, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to say we, ha we don't really know how long Turner spent there per year. Mm. We have to remember following 1815 and the Napoleonic Wars finishing, the, the opportunity to go abroad yeah. Uh, cr is created and so when Turner's house was finished in 1813 there wasn't that opportunity there was the opportunity to do what Turner was doing going the lengths, lengths and breaths you know of Britain uh, because he, he was forced to but of course with the ending of the Napoleonic Wars in 1817 we see Turner go for the second time in his career onto the continent uh, then virtually every other year there are some breaks he's going onto the continent up to six months of the year 
Mm. He's then coming back and he's doing stuff for the Royal Academy, of course. And he's got all his, he's got all his patrons to do paintings for. Now, it is a fact that Turner did not spend as much time at Sandy Coombe as he wanted to. In fact, there are records from 1815, just two years after it was completed, of Turner considering selling the house. Yeah. Not because uh, he didn't want to be there, it's because he couldn't be there because of all his commitments. And I think it's at that time that old dad, who loves it, dad is the heart and soul of the house. Uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's tending the two acres of land. He's walking to Brentford once a week to get the shop in. He's even walking to open Turner's studio in central London, believe it or not, before he actually manages to get a lift mm -hmm. on the back of a farmer's cart. Uh, Turner really does want to spend more time at Sandy Coombe, but can't. But when he is there, he has a fantastic time. We have records of other members of the Royal Academy. They have picnics, they go on boats, they go up and down the Thames, they go fishing. Mm -hmm. You know, then they come back yeah. and old dad will, will, you know, will finish it off with, with, with some beer, etc. So Turner loves it. Mm -hmm. what, what Turner's house is, it's a retreat. It's exactly what Solace Lodge said in the first place. It's a retreat for Turner to have a little bit of time and we also have to remember that when Turner's house was built, there were no neighbours. Uh, he had virtually an unrestricted view, for instance, from, 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 uh, from his window upstairs of the River Thames, mm -hmm. of Richmond Hill. He could see Marble Hill House as well. Mm -hmm. And another reason Turner wanted it there, because of all the Arcadian associations. Yeah. You know, it was a stone's mm -hmm. throw away from Pope's Villa, for instance. And we know, for instance, uh, the weeping willow that surrounded the legs were actually cuttings that come from the weeping willow tree in the garden. So Pope's one of his heroes. Right. Right. James Thompson is, you know, etc. Yes. He's got these views. He wants to be part of the Arcadian Thames. And this is all part and parcel. This yeah. retreat. But of course, once he discovers that he can go abroad and he can, he can go to Italy, go to Rome, mm -hmm. you know, uh, virtually every year if he wanted to, it's used less and less. And I think the death knell really comes in uh, 1826, where, uh, where old dad is now getting on. He's, he's in his early 80s. He can no longer look after the house. Uh, we do know, for instance, that Turner is asking people to go and visit old dad just to make sure he's still okay. Uh, his, old dad's health is not good. And so it's with great reluctance that they sell up in 1826 and move back to central London and if any of you've seen uh, the Mr Turner film that's really the period we're talking about it's just Sandicum's been sold and we've got the last three years really of old dad's life and the rest of Turner's. Yeah. This is a very humanizing story isn't it I mean that's it that we're all living at the moment under travel restrictions and quite a lot of us have elderly loved ones that he, who were having to take care of under difficult circumstances. In fact you've actually answered a couple of other questions that came in about whether there was a view from the river, uh, of the river from the house and why he didn't die there. Thinking of the, the view of the, of the house, view of the Thames from the house, mm. are there sketches and paintings from inside? The, did he go there to escape from painting or did he actually sketch and paint when he was well, inside the lodge? I, I can answer that question again. There was, I think for a number of years there was this misconception that uh, Turner had a studio there and that he was actually painting oil paintings. Well, when they did the restoration, they actually looked, for instance, at the original floorboards and found no oils. Mm. Now, that tells us he wasn't oil painting. He was probably doing drawings. And by drawings, I mean not only sketches, but probably watercolours. Yeah. Uh, and we know from his sketchbooks, for instance, there's a lot of the Richmond area. There's a lot. And actually, we had made for us a few years ago all the drawings uh, from Sandy Coombe that he did, uh, you know, evolving the process and put them into one sort of portfolio for us. It, it's fantastic. Uh, and a lot of those early, early designs, you know, uh, uh, they're very interesting. Some of them are quite Palladian with the, well, I spoke about the Diocletian window. The, in some of them, they're up above mm. and then they come down below. You know, a lot of them have the actual house extending over the slope because of course it's on the top of a hill. Yeah. It slopes away. He, you know, he had two acres of land that went towards Richmond Bridge. Uh, he also, as I mentioned, had a view of Marble Hill as well. Mm -hmm. And we've got this lovely recreation today, if you come and visit, of a graphic, which uh, obviously shows where, you know, Marble Hill in the distance, and you've got this hill, you've got this, you know, the, the, the lane, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, you know, it's quite idyllic. And that all kind of altered, I think, 
really with the coming of the railways mm -hmm. and land was so old after Turner's time and built up. But, you know, Turner had several areas of land around Twickenham. He had one in St. Margaret's, for instance, and he also later bought a plot of land in what would have been sort of old Hounds, uh, Hounslow Heath. And that was deliberate. And that brings us back to, I think, the idea of legacy. And mm. that, again, is something we see with Soane, having mm. a legacy for when they go. And yeah. he wants to build there after his death an, an old arms house for decayed artists. So uh, he, well, that was yeah. his legacy yeah. as well as his paintings. Yeah. Whereas I suppose uh, Soane's legacy could not be through his sons. It was through his building at Holborn and all the, the lovely stuff inside it. So... Uh, it, it, it's a tranquil place for Turner to relax, to go fishing as well. As I mentioned, they were big fishermen. You know, they'd fish anywhere and they loved it. And I can just imagine, for instance, uh, Soan and Turner on a boat fishing and talking about the designs. Mm. Uh, and one of the reasons yeah. probably we don't have any designs by Soan at all of the house is because it would have been discussed over a table, over a beer on a fishing trip. You know, mm -hmm. letters don't really exist. There are some. Uh, between them because they see each other quite regularly and they are the best of friends they really are and that that I so, tonight so, so, several people have asked I mean you've mentioned this name Solus Lodge and that yes. that sense of the sun and uh, yes. the, and the solitude but why is it called Sandicum Lodge was it always called that well where, Sandicum, where does that name come from? it really comes from uh, Sandicum Lane and and actually the area which which is known for sand and gravel Ah. So for, for hundreds of years, sand and gravel had been, you, you know, it had been taken out of the ground. And again, if we're looking back at some of the other lectures we've had this week, Orleans House Gallery, of course, when they demolished the main building, they demolished it for gravel. Yeah, so gravel. these are all kind of sandy, gravelly deposits, and, and that's where it takes its name. Uh, interestingly, Solace Lodge was only, only in use for about a year. Mm. But I think it is quite telling that, you know, he's associating this with the sun. And, and, I, and, and I guarantee he's getting up, getting up in the morning and he's sketching the sun as it rises and, you know, he's sketching it as it sets as well. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, although we didn't do his oil paintings there, you know, he was doing, I, I, I'm almost certain, watercolours and certain... Yeah, yeah. 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 And can I ask you a bit more about this, uh, this? And some people have commented on this amazing image of the painting with light and the, uh, the emotions in, the, in things. Mm -hmm. I was I was really struck by that uh, phrase you use of a moving work of art, that use mm. of light. But and, and you talked about the symbolism of architecture. Um, I wondered if you could say something more about the relationship between, on the one hand, um, this very bright light or this this light that's that's bright but delicate and it's kind of moving around mm. and doing things. But also, on the other hand, uh, the darkness and the sublime. And they seem to me to be very powerful things to bring together anyway, but especially in a domestic space. Oh, absolutely. I, I want to talk first a, a bit about something I learned the other day, actually. Now, I mentioned the Apollo Belvedere statue in the Soane Museum. And I learned the other day, and I didn't know this before, that it was deliberately placed under the ley light. And uh, the ley light is, has got a yellow filter on. So when the sun comes through, it, at the back of the Apollo Belvedere actually illuminates. So like a halo, yeah. Now it is it, it is possible, of course, at Turner's house with the niche, uh, which we don't know what was in the niche, but we do know from the inventory of 1851 when Turner died of his townhouse, he had uh, a composite uh, bust of Apollo. Now, could it have been that Apollo was in uh, that niche? And as I yeah. say, usually around the summer solstice, just after that. Uh, that floral motif is projected onto the walls and it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the similar thing. Yeah. And things about the use of colour of light and darkness, I often think it's all to do with duality, mm. that one can't really exist without the other. And I think that plays a little bit into some of, uh, some of, of Turner's ideas, for instance, the one that every great civilization will eventually end mm. and something new will be born. Mm. So I don't know if there's something even, if I could say initiatory into this, this, this kind of idea, but certainly the sublime and the idea of epochs with Turner was something that was very important. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing will yeah. last forever, except that we are so small compared to nature yeah. around us. 
yeah yeah there's another related to that there's another duality that you mentioned that i'd like to hear you expand on and that's uh the relationship between uh, the idea that sort of the temple yeah. the grand the public uh revival of severe classical um polished um mm. architecture but on the other hand the rustic yeah, absolutely. And the, that the, seems like a curious mixture of the, the yeah. Well, may, may, maybe Do go ahead. Turns, uh, Turner's House is a little bit of a melting pot, really, of architectural styles, to be quite honest. But what is what I really like about Turner's House is that these these this this architecture is not overbearing. It's not in your face. You can read it almost like a book. It's it's so simple and so stripped back. It is a it's a stripped back primitive kind of architecture. And of course, there were these discourses going around at this particular time about the origins of architecture and the symbolism where architecture comes from. You could have your very basic primitive hut with basically four posts and a roof. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, of course, the Romans elaborated on it. So you've kind of got this discourse going on, which Soane is absolutely fascinated with. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's influenced by so many different yeah. architects. And I think sometimes he can't even make his own mind up or he changes his mind. Yeah. But it's, certainly yeah. mixing, Turner would have, would have been in on that as well. Yeah. Because he yeah. liked the intellectual kind of conversations, as it were. Yeah. Particularly in the yeah. Royal Academy, you know, he liked the, he liked the competition. But he liked the intellectual aspects of it as well. And that very idea of primitivism, even taking architecture back. So it's very solemn in, in many ways, primitive architecture. For instance, if we looked at the Dulwich Picture Gallery, which actually contains, as you know, a, a, you know, a tomb, it's very bleak. Yeah. For me, it's quite exciting. Yes. You know? uh, yeah. You've got these very stripped back, minimal aspects that hark back you know, to ancient Rome. And of course, Soane was also obsessed if, uh, with, with the idea of the furniture of death and what it all meant mm -hmm. as well. And, you know, the, the producing of sarcophaguses and tombs. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're some of the, old, the oldest objects we have in the world are, are tombs and sarcophaguses yeah. and all yeah. of that. Now, you could relate that probably or perhaps to the unfortunate set of circumstances he had with his son, his sons, you know, and and uh, his wife and all of that kind of stuff, or just his, his outlook on it. Uh, but yeah, the, the idea, I think, of the primitive and the primitive heart is yeah. something that I've, I've actually started to look at in a lot of mm -hmm. at the moment, looking at this and how Turner was influenced, as Soane was, in, in these kind of architectural discourses, discourses. And of course, what was happening in France as well with a lot of the architects, such as Boulle, uh, for instance, he was interested in and Lacroix and Ledoux and all of these kind of things as well. So it's 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 a very interesting building. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's like I mean columns that you find in temples or in mm. cathedrals. These are reminiscents of of forests and trees and groves. And Absolutely, groves there, and there, like there, there was this discourse, of course, uh, going right back that uh, trees were the the earliest uh, columns. Mm. And sacred groves, if you won a battle, for instance, you'd praise, you, you know, you'd thank the God by putting armour and body parts in there. And that over time that these become, uh, you know, features within architecture. Yes. But then yes. there are other people who say, well, actually, it's the building processes and it's the reminiscence of the building processes. Yes. Yes. But, and, yes. and it's yes. all, you know, it's really, really interesting, actually, yes. when you, once you yes. actually look at the origins of architecture, what people thought and, and still think today, actually. Can I can I get you back to Pitzhanger as well? Uh, one of our audience members has very helpfully pointed out that Pitzhammer, Pitzhanger Manor, hard for yep. me to say, is open this weekend as part of uh, the London Open House series, so we have a chance mm -hmm. to go to it. You began by mentioning um, Turner's visits to Pitzhanger, yep. and you said in passing that he is one of the few people who could yeah. stay. And I think there's more of a story to that. Could you? Could well, it, that it's very interesting. <laughs> What I point out to people, first of all, and it would be a really nice fit, but it's not a fit, of course, because uh, Pitts Hanger, uh, uh, so lit, well, actually owned it between 1800 and 1810. Now, if we look at uh, Sandycombe Lodge, uh, although the land was bought in 1807, 
the tower wasn't actually started till 1810. So we, it would be lovely if I could say, oh, Turner was walking over from Sandy Coombe to Pitsanger and vice versa. It wasn't true because at that particular time, for instance, uh, Turner had actually uh, moved from Isleworth and was renting a house in Hammersmith. So it would either have been from his London studio or Hammersmith. He was actually visiting. So, but uh, the, I think the irony is he was one of the only people that were, was allowed to spend the night there. And yet he probably lived one of the closest. Everybody else was going back in their horse and carriages back into central London. And uh, maybe that's the reason why there's so few bedrooms actually at Pitsanger because Soane didn't want that many people staying over. <laughs> Yes, but I yes. can just imagine, you know, the next day them both getting up, having a bit of food and then going out and fish, fishing on the lakes. Because this is something else that I think that was copied at Sandy Coombe because Turner had, uh, I think they may have existed anyway, but he certainly extended the lake into two lakes or one adjoined. And there's, there, there are lovely stories of him catching fish and bringing them back alive and emptying them into the ponds. And so that uh, when needed, they could recatch the fish fresh and another little interesting story about there were two uh, there were two or three children that understood what was happening and they went out and caught a pike which is a very predatory fish and emptied it into the lake knowing very well that it would eat all the but other it fish. Would double up. yes yes you kind of, you kind of got yes. this kind of benny hill scene i imagine it in my mind's eye of yes. turner and his father trying to get the pike out before it eats the rest of the fish but yeah absolutely fishing was a core yes. part of what turner did for relaxation uh, for that very purpose, I think he could just mm. relax, he could think about things, his next move, you know, and that for him was relaxation, if mm. he ever could relax to that yeah. extent. Yeah. Well, that is, is sort of Twickenham in a nutshell, isn't it? That very special relationship between this village, this dwelling place, and the river, the Arcadia, and also those connections between the different houses and people that we've talked about, the very close friendship between Soane and Turner, and that extraordinary fertile exchange of ideas. So I want to, to end on that, that point and to thank Ricky so much for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, there have been some lovely comments in the, in the, in the chat saying uh, how much they've in, enjoyed your talk. I, I certainly have, and I wish we could carry on this conversation. We do hope that we'll be able to have other um, things like this. If you would like to donate, just go to our website and there are donation buttons on every page. <laughs> and we really would encourage okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. And thank That's you all for coming. Thank you. thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.